So thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, New Institute. Uh, I understand that the topic. So, what does one do with this? Okay. Is there just a, maybe I can just use a physical pointer or something? This one. Yeah. Okay. So I understand that the topic of integrable systems is not exactly the specialty of most of the people in the audience. So I'm going to try as much as I can to uh, sort of give a crash course. Can everyone hear me all right? Can you, or can you understand me all right? <laughs> is the main question. In the, in the back, can you hear me all right? It's okay? No, not so good. Not so good. But this isn't, doesn't seem to be. Oh, I should just speak louder? I see, okay, okay. But now we just lost the picture also. Okay, so, no. All right. So what does one do? Is that on? Yes. Okay. So uh, the title, Tau Functions, Convolution, Symmetries, and Applications, comes from integrable systems. However, the notion of a Tau function is a very general notion, and it has other applications. So I promised to Peter that I would at least mention one application to, uh, to random processes, which is perhaps closer to the interests of the majority of the people here. But uh, in the way, I have to do a certain uh, crash course introduction if it's not something familiar, and that's going to take up probably the fa first half of the lecture. How much time, by the way? Uh, an hour. An hour, okay. So fine. So uh, here's an outline. The first half will just be a review of the theory of tau functions in relation to theory of integrable systems uh, and with some examples. These integrable systems essentially correspond to uh, infinite dynamical systems with commuting flows, an infinite number of commuting flows on some infinite manifold. So it's a rather uh, complicated thing. It really refers to solutions integrable of integrable systems of partial, usually partial differential equations or differential difference equations. And that was the original context in which the idea of the tau function came up. I'd like to just introduce you to these so-called integrable hierarchies. The KP or karoncev petriashvili hierarchy is a certain system of partial differential equations with an infinite number of independent parameters which can be thought of as an infinite commuting f uh, system of commuting flows or, or as a dynamical system involving... Uh, this might be a problem. Yeah. Maybe I should leave it like this, I don't know. If it's on the full view it seems to... Uh, Conk out. Okay, so in this there's a certain formalism. The ge there's a geometrical formalism which, was, which goes back some 35 years, uh, which interprets the tau functions and the, uh, and the differential equations that are satisfied in terms of flows on an infinite Grassmann manifold. So I don't know if uh, that's a concept that is familiar to most of you. I'll try to make it as self-contained as I can. It's a sort of universal phase space. One thinks of flows in a phase space and all of the, uh, these vast classes of flows are embedded in one universal phase space. And as usual in geometry, that is a Grassmannian. That's a typical uh, universal space in which all the dynamics can be embedded in some kind of canonical way. So the tau function is thought of as some sort of function on, this, uh, on a, a group of abelian flow variables, so it's an abelian group, which is acting on this Grassmannian. So the, the abelian group flows is on the Grassmannian. However, later on, just anticipating uh, the... the uh, power source. Power source? Yeah. We could do that. I don't have a, I don't have a power uh, generator. Even, no. Do you think that would make a difference? That may. Does anyone have a Mac power generator? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's that, uh, so Peter thinks that maybe because it's not yeah, receiving a power source, that might be the origin. 
but uh, I mean it's it's conking up periodically. But do you have a just a power uh, a power cord? Okay, I'll just keep doing it like this. I mean, well, okay. So so the tau function. I'll introduce a systematic definition, but the main point is that one thinks of it as a function, yeah, as a function of uh, a certain number of dynamical uh, parameters. These are the flow parameters or multi-times of the system. But in the applications which we'll see towards the end of the lecture, this is not the interpretation of, the, uh, of these parameters. The parameters are for the purposes of generating functions for random processes, which I gather you'll be more familiar with. The, um, the generating function parameters are really just parameters that are either evaluated at certain values or are used just for bookkeeping, for understanding transition rates and so on in terms of coefficients of a series. Uh huh. Okay. Maybe that'll. Seems to be alive now. Okay. So we'll see what the role of that is later on. But first I want to do this general introduction. Then there's another approach which just comes naturally from the Grassmannian formulation, namely a Grassmann manifold is just an algebraic variety. In this case it's actually an infinite dimensional version. It's an algebraic variety which means it's defined by <coughs> a certain number of polynomial equations uh, defined on a projective on a projective space. But as a geometrical object, it's thought of as its points. The elements of a Grassmann manifold are subspaces of some given vector space. So you think of a whole variety of subspaces forming an algebraic manifold. And that's what the Grassmannian is. But there's a natural construction dating from the beginning of uh, projective geometry, which is the so-called Plücker embedding, which takes the Grassmann manifold and realizes it precisely as a sub-variety of a, just a projective, a projective space, a projective variety, through <coughs> the satisfaction of a certain number, simultaneously of a certain number of quadratic polynomial equations. So it's uh, otherwise put, this is called the Plücker map, or the Plücker embedding. And that places us into a certain space through a natural embedding, which we'll see. Um, and that space itself has an algebraic structure. It is a Grassmann algebra. That is, it's the algebra formed on some underlying vector space by forming all exterior products. So that exterior product space for physicists is called a fermionic Fox space. So that leads one to something which maybe most of you are not familiar with, but is very familiar to most mathematical physicists, namely fermionic Fox space. The Grassmannian can be thought of as sitting in some kind of exterior algebra, infinite dimensional in general, and that is what we call the fermionic Fox space on which we have so-called creation and annihilation operators, which are natural realizations of exterior product and interior product and we have a Clifford algebra and so on. So there's a nice algebraic structure behind all of this which provides an alternative viewpoint of, for what tau functions are. At first we'll see a tau function is a natural determinant of a certain projection operator and then we'll see how we can use it to actually uh, define solutions to these uh, abelian uh, flow equations. And then it is realized in a different way which is in the spirit of quantum field theory where one takes a vacuum state, which is uh, some state in the fermionic Fox space, and one takes an operator which is constructed fermionically depending on the deformation parameters and evaluates matrix elements in this vacuum state of this operator or the flow operator. So that's <coughs> that will be the first half of the talk and that will be a kind of crash course in these methods on tau functions and integrable systems. The second half we'll uh, look at some new uh, formulations of these abelian group flows. Actually, I'll replace the standard one that appears uh, that's familiar to all people in integrable systems with another abelian group which I call convolution flows because they really do act as convolution maps or convolution products on a certain Hilbert space, uh, an L2 Hilbert space. <coughs> and uh, the reason why I introduced that is because the examples of interest of tau functions are a, a rather non-standard variety. They satisfy the same equations as the standard tau functions, but they're constructed somewhat differently in this abelian flow group sense, and that's what 
the convolution groups, um, uh, group flows uh, entail. So this will be the main content of the second half of the, of the lecture. And I will give two types of applications, or maybe a little bit more if there's time. One will be, uh, here one has randomness, because one can characterize uh, for certain random point processes, which are viewed as the random distribution of the eigenvalues of a random matrix. Uh, one looks at these as probability distributions and, um, and deforms them. There's a certain way in which the abelian group, which acts dynamically, acts on the measure, the, the probability measure, to give a deformation family of measures. And this is the object that turns out the partition function. I hope that everyone knows what a partition function is. So that's the normalization factor when you have weighted probabilities for different states. The partition function turns out then to depend on these deformation parameters in just such a way that it is a tau function, and hence the differential equations that are studied in integrable systems are, stu are satisfied by these partition functions, which gives a handle on computing what the partition functions are. So that's one class of applications. And what I'll show you in this case is that if you apply this method of convolutions, convolution symmetries, to standard known matrix models, uh, which are so-called self-coupled matrix models, one can transform the tau function or the partition function through such a convolution symmetry into another matrix model, which is equally important, <coughs> which are the so-called externally coupled matrix models which include, for instance, the uh, koncevich witten integral, which generates certain uh, invariance of, of uh, moduli spaces, and other uh, externally coupled matrix models, which have important applications in, in physics. And this, the second application will be perhaps the closest to the uh, interests of the majority of people who are studying uh, random processes, is to interpret the tau function essentially as a, again, either a partition function or a weight on path space to define a random process. So that's the last application. That's, it's, not, it's not new work. It's uh, based on work by a number of people, uh, amongst others, Okunkov, Reshetichin, Pantari Pandey, and others who have studied random processes using the tau function as a kind of generating function for random processes. So that will be the, and in particular, just to illustrate this, I'll show how this works in the case of random three-dimensional partitions, which is, can be interpreted uh, physically as, as a growing or, or melting crystal, and that will be the last uh, application. So that's the overview. Now begins the uh, introduction to uh, something which I presume for the majority of the audience is not familiar. So we're all at the same level. So how to define a KP tau function? This is purely formal. A uh, tau function tau depends on an infinite sequence of these flow variables, t1, t2, et cetera, which you can just think of as complex numbers. And it's characterized by the fact that it satisfies not one, but an infinite set of partial differential equations which are bilinear. That is, you can think of it just like in, in the algebraic sense, a, a, a bilinear operator which acts by differentiation. It's constant coefficient bilinear operator. And, the way, and this is just a formal way to do it. If you, uh, if you think of it this way, take your tau function here and translate it. This is, remember, tau bold here, t bold is just a sequence of flow parameters. This symbol, z inverse with a square, is exactly this sequence, 1 over z, 1 over 2z squared, etc. It's, it's the terms in the series, in the, in the uh, Laurent series, for log of 1 minus 1 over z. If you think of that, uh, the Laurent series for that about the origin, that's exactly the terms. You translate the, t the uh, this is just a, as they say in French, a cuisine, a prescription for defining these equations. It's just the fastest way I know how to do it. There are other ways to do it. You take the tau function, you translate it either in the plus or minus direction by this infinite vector, normalize it 
by dividing by itself, and multiply by this exponential infinite factor, which is the sum of the parameters ti times the ith power of z. We don't ask questions about convergence at this stage, analyticity, etc. Take these as formal series, but by choosing a suitable domain of definition of the deformation parameters, these can be convergent series. I don't want to address that question at the moment. This is called a Baker function or baker Achieser function, and it's dual. The plus or minus are called the dual, the original Baker function, the dual. And as you can see, if I take the two and multiply them together, evaluated at two different points, this infinite vector t and another one, t plus s, and require formally, if I make a Laurent expansion about infinity of both these series, combining all the terms and all derivatives here, this will be bilinear in the function tau. Part of it is a given function, the rest is proportional to tau and its derivatives as we expand in a series in Z. And the whole system of so-called Hirota bilinear equations, which are equations for tau, bilinear differential equations to, for tau with constant coefficients, is contained in this one relation. There are other fancy ways to write the relation. I won't take the time to do it, but it's very easy to write the relation parametrically in a number of equivalent ways. And eventually one computes from that if you can find any function whatsoever, tau, that satisfies this infinite set, this should be identically in the second set of parameters s, which identifies all of these bilinear relations, that is a tau function. Take that as the definition of a tau function. Now what is this object? How do you construct them and what do they mean? So I'm, I'd like to persuade you that this is a very universal notion and, they have, and it appears in many places and in more familiar form as special cases of this general construction. So actually, I think I'm going to go off the, uh, the uh, projected presentation to give you at least a little bit of a notion of why this is called a KP tau function. This is a diversion which I'm just adding to complete the picture from the viewpoint of integrable systems. So let's just take something which is called the KP hierarchy. The main point is that the, this function, which I call the baker hakeser function, satisfies simultaneously an infinity of partial linear partial differential equations of this form, where we identify the first deformation parameter with x, something along the real line, or possibly complex, and the others are whatever they are. di is a differential operator in the x variable only, but the coefficients all depend on all the t's. And it looks like this. We introduce formally, this is a formal definition, we introduce a formal derivation, which is ddx acting on functions of x, t2, t3, etc. <coughs> we introduce a formal, this is just a, a gimmick for defining in the fastest possible way the uh, differential equations of the KP hierarchy. Here's derivation, and here are pseudo-differential operators, negative powers. This should be thought of purely as an algebraic construction where uh, negative powers can be treated by a suitable composition law that satisfies Leibniz rule with coefficients. So all the UIs depend on all the variables. And this is just a, an, a construction, an object which allows us to extract some partial differential equations in a simple way. We raise this to the power i. That gives a pseudo differential operator whose positive derivations is, uh, go to power i, so it's a degree i, and we just project to the positive part. So this is the, this is the differential operator part of the pseudo-differential operator. And we call that di. Then this system, the Baker function itself can be subjected to a series expansion in the parameter z, And all the coefficients can be thought of as functions of all of the deformation parameters. 
then this is an infinitely overdetermined system of partial differential equations. It should be thought of as equations that that must satisfy compatibility conditions in terms of the coefficients, which means that when you cross-differentiate, you must have the same answer. So DDTI, DDTJ equals DDTJ, DDTI. Which means that in order for this to be compatible, the following differential equations have to be satisfied. These are all differential operators. This is simply a differential operator in the x variable alone, but this is a partial differential operator with respect to a flow an infinity of different flow parameters. And this, these equations, these, are equa these should be thought of as equations for the coefficients ai. And that's the equations of the so-called KP hierarchy. John, you have to say that the commentator is zero. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to say zero. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's the compatibility condition. Okay, so that's the fastest way I can describe what is the KP hierarchy. I don't want to say where it comes from, but it has a long history. It, it was invented a long time ago in the context of nonlinear waves, integral nonlinear waves, and has applications, but it really contains a huge amount of information. Uh, and it turns out that because this is such a universal system, by various reductions, many of the most interesting integral equations of the so-called solitonic type fit into this picture. Uh, <laughs> Professor Matveyev here is one of the pioneers in the subject, so he, he is uh, certainly familiar with all of this, but uh, it's a subject that is pretty well established. Anyway, so, so the idea is that the, the purpose of the tau function in this context, integrable systems, is to construct solutions of this hierarchy. If you have a tau function, and the theorem is, Anything that satisfies that bilinear system gives rise through, ah, I forgot to connect the two. I have to connect the tau function. Maybe I did connect it. Yes, the connection is over here. The relationship between the Baker function, yeah, I gave that before. Between the Baker function and the tau function is given by this formula. So if you know a tau that satisfies this infinite infinity of bilinear equations, you have got a set of solutions of this integrable hierarchy, and vice versa. That's uh, the opposite is not so obvious. <coughs> okay, so that's the integrable systems context, but what does it mean? How do we construct these things? Well, there was a beautiful insight due to Sato and Siegel and Wilson a long time ago, which gave a geometrical interpretation of, th of those bilinear equations that I just erased. Uh, let me write it down in another way, because maybe this is too much of a mouthful. We're talking about formal infinite series, formal residues, etc. I'm going to write that bilinear system in another form that is equivalent to it, which is maybe a little more digestible, as follows. So equivalently, I'm giving an equivalent form of the Hirota bilinear system. Take any four complex numbers. Uh, complex numbers. And write down the following object for every pair of i, j between i different from j between 1 and 4. Write down psi i, j is equal to z i minus z j times tau of this infinite set of variables minus the same shift we had before with z1, zi, and zj. Okay. Now, I'm going to use a key tool which will come back over and over again through the lectures. So I'd like you to, if you're not familiar with Grassmannians and Plicker maps, look at this one because it's the easiest example. I want to think of this, this is an anti-symmetric matrix. I want to think of psi as an exterior, an element of an exterior space, a space of two forms on a vector space. It's an element of lambda 2, C4, or the dual. Okay? 
just an anti-symmetric matrix, which I can think of as psi ij, some basis ei wedge ej summed i less than j up to a four. Okay, so that's psi. I can also consider the simplest possible Grassmann, well, almost the simplest possible Grassmann manifold. What is that? This cons the points of this algebraic variety are two-dimensional subspaces of a complex four-dimensional space. Okay? So if I say that, and you ask yourself, yeah, how many two-dimensional subspaces are there of a four-dimensional space? A little bit thinking, and you'll see that it, it, it itself is a four-dimensional space. And it can be described by choosing a basis. So you can think of it as the span of two linearly independent vectors in C4. Okay? The Pricker map embeds this manifold. Well, I should say, here I have two four vectors. In principle, that seems to give eight dimensions. But I can also make any change of basis. So I have a GL2 group action, which is also four-dimensional. So eight minus four is four, and the dimension of the space is four. Okay, so we have a four-dimensional space, and we're going to embed it not quite into this, this is a six-dimensional space, anti-symmetric four by four matrices, but we're going to projectivize so that we'll give a five-dimensional space. I'm going to embed this into into the projectivization, so all rays, of this exterior space. So this is the projective space that I promised to embed the Grassmannian, and it's, it's four-dimensional, it's a five-dimensional projective space. Its embedding is given by one relation, it's one quadric inside of that. It's very easy to see what it is because the Plicker map takes the pair, the span of W1, W2 into the most obvious thing, the exterior product. But the change of basis, I could make a change of basis here, that'll change the image. But at most, if it, that is a change of basis, it will, it will change it by a scalar multiplication by the determinant of that map. It'll have a two by a... So in fact, I should say the equivalence class under projectivization, that is, I could always multiply by a non-vanishing complex scalar. So that's the Plicker map. And the image of this map is what we're going to call Xi. And it should be evident, because Xi is the exterior product of two terms, that if you take Xi and take the exterior product with itself, it gives zero. Because you have the same term, anti-symmetrized twice. So the Plicker relation, there's only one of them, Xi wedge Xi equals zero. Now I'm, I'm taking the time to say this very careful, very carefully, because the whole theory of the tau function is going to depend on a generalization of this, but this is just one simple example. And here we have a four-parametric family of coordinates for some element of this, and I require that this be satisfied. Let me write it out in detail. If you don't like exterior product, just look at what it means. You have to anti-symmetrize, and this relation is equivalent to psi 1, 2, psi 3, 4, plus all cyclic permutations, and there are only two cyclic permutations, is equal to zero. Okay? So that is exactly the Plicker relation, the single Plicker relation, the quadric in this five-dimensional projective space that cuts out the Grassmannian. And if you think of this as identically satisfied, identically in all these parameters, from the very definition of the Xi, which is linear in tau, with cons constant coefficients, translations, expand this out as a power series in the Zs and equate all coefficients to zero, and you get something which, after careful consideration, is exactly the same. So this is another, e this is, I would say, an easier way to tell somebody what is the Hirota bilinear relations. But it doesn't explain why they're important, it just says what they are. Okay. <laughs>
So now I can go back to the, uh, to the format. And I, I was supposed to be finished with the introduction by this time, and I'm not. So I have to take a little more time. But I hope that makes it a little clearer. OK, now we're going to be we're going to take this little example, which was in four dimensions, and extend it to infinite dimensions. Because that's the geometrical way to understand all of these relations. Those parameters really should be expansion parameters for some Hilbert space. <coughs> <coughs> so let's consider the Hilbert space of L2 functions on the circle, which we can split, as usual, into the Hardy space, those which are holomorphic on the interior of the unit disk, and those which are holom extend holomorphically to the exterior. That's the sum of h plus and h minus. We can choose an orthonormal basis consisting of monomials. And now just jump to infinite dimensions. Consider subspaces of this Hilbert space, which are in some sense commensurable with this part, h plus. So one point in that Grassmann, that's going to be a Grassmannian, an infinite Grassmann. One point will be given by h plus, the Hardy space. And every other point will be somehow given by the action of some general linear group on that one subspace, because it will be a homogeneous space of the general linear group. So the commensurability, I don't want to go into technical details. It just says that the orthogonal projection onto H plus uh, should be a Fredholm map. So it should have an index, a finite kernel and co-kernel. And the complementary projection to H minus should be in some sense small. Usually, we require it to be a compact operator. Don't worry about that. And here's the orthonormal basis of monomials. Notice the flip in the sign of the integers. And if we take an element of this infinite Grassmannian, it can be thought of as a span of a denumerable infinite sequence of linearly independent vectors in the Hilbert space, which you can refer to the orthonormal basis and thereby interpret the elements of the Grassmannian in terms of doubly infinite by singly infinite matrices labeled by the integers. So a rectangular matrix, which is doubly infinite in the vertical direction, and singly infinite in the horizontal direction. So this goes from 1 to infinity. This goes from minus infinity to infinity. Its columns should be thought of as the basis vectors that span the subspace. Okay. So such rectangular matrices up to a change of basis, just like in the finite case, represent an element of the infinite Grassmannian. And now I have to introduce this abelian group action, and it's a natural one. The thing that we saw in the definition of the tau function, this exponential factor, which was thought of just as a formal exponential, obviously under multiplication, these can be thought of as non-vanishing elements of the Hilbert space, and you can act on the Hilbert space by multiplication. That's an abelian group action. So we have an abelian group action, either the plus or the minus powers. We'll call that gamma plus minus. And it depends on an infinity of abelian group parameters. These are the linear group parameters. It can also be thought of in terms of this matrix representation as lifted to the Grassmannian simply by acting on each column vector by multiplication, but represented in the orthonormal basis that gives you a matrix. And what is it? It's the exponential of the shift matrix. Multiplication by z shifts the basis element z to the i to z to the i plus 1. That means the basis element ei is shifted to e to the i minus 1. Lambda is just the infinite shift operator, which takes each basis element to the previous one. And so that infinite group action matricially can be represented this way as an infinite sum of powers of the shift operator. And that is what generates the KP dynamics. How? Well, OK. More generally, we could have any general linear group action on the Hilbert space. Write it as the exponential of an algebra action, but I'll leave that for the moment. How does it act? The following way. And this is going to be the formal definition of the tau function which is a necessary and sufficient condition to satisfy the conditions that I wrote in the previous transparency. Namely, allow w of t to represent the moving point in the Grassmannian. You start out with an initial point w. You act by that gamma plus group action. And that gives you a time-dependent or orbit-dependent point, w t. 
in the Grassmannian. It can be represented by rectangular matrices, and we can take the determinant of the projection of this to the H plus subspace, which means the determinant of this infinite matrix. That is the tau function. So believe it or not, the previous two definitions, this one and the one involving Hirota relations, are exactly equivalent to this. There are other ways to express it, but this is, this is the key to the geometry of the tau function. It is the determinant of a projection operator under the action of an infinite abelian group. And just like here, we had one Plücke relation which told us how the Grassmannian fits into the exterior space. Sato told us how to interpret the Hirota bilinear relations that I have here as Plücke relations, exactly the Plücke relations, but not in this four-dimensional Grassmannian, but in the infinite Grassmannian that I described here. Okay. So that sounds like a, lo a mouthful, but now I'm going to give you a couple of examples of these things to show that they're not so ferocious as it seems. In fact, the tau function embodies many familiar constructs from group theory, combinatorics, representation theory, algebraic geometry, Riemann surfaces, etc. All as special cases. So it's really a very universal construct. It is not limited to the KP hierarchy as its interest. I'm going to describe the simplest building block example of a tau function in another way. I'm going to actually, is there an eraser? This is the eraser. All right. This is a very important rudimentary element for tau functions. It's the, it is the building block out of which all other tau functions are constructed. And it's called a sure function. It's written S lambda of t. Depends on the same variable, so it actually is a yeah, of the same category. And lambda here is an integer partition. So an integer partition is a weakly decreasing sequence of integers, non-negative integers, Uh, which are usually represented by a Young diagram. Here's the number of blocks here is lambda 1, the number of blocks here is lambda 2, and so on. And eventually it all becomes zero. The number of elements is called the length. So sure functions are labeled by such partitions. How are they defined? Uh, could you please raise your hand if you've seen a sure function before? Okay, so with apologies to th those people who raised their hands, I'm going to ask those people who raised their hands a question. Who introduced the sure function first? Historically. Do you have any idea? Do you know? Volodya? Oh, no. Well, Jacobi Trudy formula concerns sure function, so at least Jacobi knew what it was. But it wasn't Jacobi. It was before, it was Legendre. As far as I know, the earliest reference I know is Legendre. It's in the study of symmetric polynomials. And it was studied in great detail by Jacobi Trudy, who knew nothing, by Jacobi and his student Trudy, who knew nothing about group representations or anything else, except what they knew. Uh, it actually is a group character. It's a group character which can be thought of this way. If the ti's themselves are thought of as monomial sums of some other variables, any number of variables, x, x's, x1, x2, etc., possibly up to a finite number, possibly infinite. So this is the definition. Okay? Here is a formula which, who knows the vile character formula? Okay, we're diminishing in numbers. This is a special case of the vile character formula. It gives you a group character for GLN, and it looks like this. 
the lambdas should be thought of as weights from the viewpoint of group representation theory, but you don't have to think of it like that. This is the van der Monde determinant, which means the product of xi minus xj, i less than j. This is the, a special case of the vile character formula. It's a polynomial, even though it's a ratio. It looks like a ratio, but they cancel, so it's a polynomial. There are many other formulas for it, n not many ways. But the main thing is, this is a very important building block for tau functions. So theorem, this object, thought of as this, a function of this infinity variables, satisfies all those conditions that I gave. And if you ask me, which element of the Grassmannian does it correspond to, I can tell you. It's the following. Define a matrix phi, which depends on these indeterminates, x1 up to xn, which looks like an infinite increasing van der Monde matrix. So I'm going to put 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. There are n columns, x1, x2 up to xn, x1 squared, x2 squared, and keep going xn squared, keep going as high as you want, say capital N minus 1, if you're dealing with a finite Grassmannian, it doesn't matter. Take that and keep going. Okay? Out of these, you can form blocks picking out rows, where each row is determined by this formula. Simply rotate the partition lambda i to, as a graph, by 45 degrees. Uh, we should really add n to make sure these are positive. And out of that subset form, that's what we'll call phi lambda, consists of the rows of this. I don't know how to do it, but the rows, the elf, just, just these rows. We have a square matrix, take a square matrix, and we take the determinant of that. divided by the standard one corresponding to the zeroth partition, which is the bottom block. Then that is exactly equal to this, as you can see by inspection. At the same time, it's the tau function corresponding to a certain element w, lambda, of the Grassmannian. And that w lambda is exactly the subspace spanned by the basis elements, E, L1, E, L2, and so on, ad infinitum. You do the calculation, it's a simple determinantal calculation, you find that element of the Grassmannian gives you a sure function. Why do I call that the elementary building block? Because every sure function can be written as a linear combination of those, uh, every tau function can be written as a linear combination of those sure functions for all tau, all tau functions corresponding to a w can be written as a linear combination summed over partitions of s lambda of t and here what we put in is exactly those subdeterminants that I was defining before, which are called Plicker coordinates. They are the coordinates relative to the standard basis, L1, L2, etc. <coughs> the Plicker coordinates are, defi are defined that way of some element of the W. These satisfy bilinear relations, which are called the Plicker relations, just like in the case of the Grassmannian of two planes in C4. Only here we have an infinite set of them. And these bilinear relations are exactly equivalent to the Hirota bilinear relations. So that's how we connect up the geometry of the Grassmannian with a standard abelian group action with the notion of the tau function. Now I better skip forward faster, I won't get to any examples. But now you know what a tau function is and you know how to interpret it geometrically. The rest consists of examples.
And I think you've seen one example. Here's another example. If you write down the partition function for a random matrix model. So this is already in reduced form. Let me write the original random matrix model on the blackboard. Uh, if you're thinking, for instance, so this is random uh, Hermitian n by n matrices. Okay, so what does that mean? We're going to, our space, our, our uh, um, the space on which there will be a probability measure will be the space of Hermitian matrices, n by n matrices. And the measure, to begin with, we can just take the elementary Lebesgue measure formed out of the linearly dependent matrix elements. So let's call that d mu zero of m. That's just where you treat the real and complex parts as independent variables and take a product. Now that is really with respect to the matrix elements, this is really a product space. It's a product of the probability. We could put in a, 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 Gauss, a Gaussian weight if we want, but let's be more general. Instead, of, we could put in a Gaussian weight, which amounts to writing something like minus the trace of m squared here. That would give a uniform Gaussian weight to all the matrix elements. But instead of this, let's replace this by an arbitrary series of trace invariants of all degrees. And we'll put in our deformation parameters here, all degrees. So we get something familiar, again, in terms of the same parameters as before. This takes all possible deformations into account. You could take a quadratic polynomial to have a Gaussian measure, or a quartic polynomial, something that is convergent, because eventually we want to think of this as an integral over the eigenvalues of the matrix. So we define a measure that looks like this. We have to normalize it, so there should be a, a partition function, which is the integral over all of this. And it depends on all the deformation parameters. So my statement is that this partition function, which defines the, this measure, uh, is a tau function. In a more interesting form, since we're mainly interested in averages in matrix models, averages of conjugation invariant functions under unitary conjugation. So if we're only interested in expectation values of functions which are unitary conjugation invariant, I don't know if this can be seen in the back, then we may as well reduce this whole thing to an integral of the, over the eigenvalues. And there's a familiar formula. I'm just going to write it here because, well, all right, the formula is already there. Once you do that reduction, what you get is what's on the transparency. The Z, in general, can be a complex variable. But for Hermitian matrices, it's a real variable. And the gamma is just the real axis. Unlike the full matrix model, where the individual matrix entries are uncoupled, they're, they're uh, independent random variables, the eigenvalues are not independent random variables, they are, they are coupled. There's a, a joint probability density which involves this factor, and that's the van der Monde determinant, which couples one eigenvalue to another using, uh, in the physical sense, a logarithmic potential. So this is the reduced f function. It's defined by an n-fold integral function of ti, and this turns out to be a tau function. So I told you that every tau function can be expanded in a basis of sure functions, and the coefficients satisfy the Plicker relations. So I better be able to tell you what the coefficients are and why they satisfy the Plicker relations. So I'll tell you. This partition function can be expanded as a sum over all partitions whose um, length 
is less than or equal to n, all others' coefficients disappear, times the Schur function, times something here, which I'll just label as m lambda, which is entirely determined from this probability measure. And what it is, is the following. Uh, so if we forget the interaction term, which is the delta squared term, uh, we would again have a, a product measure in one variable. Let's write down that measure. I'll just do it here. So write down a one variable measure, which is just the usual Lebesgue measure times exponential ti x to the i. Okay. Take that measure and compute its moments. Matrix of moments, well, mi is the ith moment of this measure. Out of mi, I can form a uh, Hankel matrix. Namely, just take m of i plus j. That's a Hankel matrix. It has equal anti-diagonal elements. It only depends on the sum. Form the determinant of this for all ij between, uh, sorry, I don't want the determinant of this. Just, just, okay. what I want is a matrix mij, and now I want to form a uh, determinant out of the so this is an infinite uh, matrix. A su I want to form a finite matrix out of the partition in question. So I'm only going to consider m lambda i, and, I, and I'm not sure if I have this right, m lambda i j. I may have a, an incorrect factor here. And I take the determinant of that for 1 between i, j, and n. That's the determinant of the finite n by n submatrix of the matrix of moments, and that coincides with this. So, in this case, uh, why this satisfies the Bricker relations is an algebraic calculation. It's not hard to do it. It's related to the Cauchy-Binet identity. But that's one example in probability theory of the appearance of a tau function that one can compute explicitly in terms of a one variable family of measures. I want to skip fast forward to, I think I have to entirely skip the theory of uh, convolution products just to get to a, uh, ah, what a pity. I only have five minutes left, right? Yes. Mm, okay. I'm going to say another random matrix application mm -hmm. of tau functions, but uh, I don't think that's going to work. Okay. Instead, I'll just go to one other application, which was in the outline which is uh, pretty, which is the generating function for, or the correlators of crystal growth. I think I'm just going to write down the answer because there's no time really to go through it. Here's a formula. Ah, unfortunately I didn't introduce the fermionic. <laughs> okay, so we really don't have too much time for this, but I have to write down a fermionic formula to make sense of this. So let me anticipate that that tau function is going to uh, act as a generating function for the random process of crystal melting or crystal growth thought of as a process of three-dimensional partitions. So 3D partitions, if you think of Young diagrams as 2D partitions, you can turn this into a three-dimensional uh, model by building levels. So you put in numbers here which are strictly decreasing, let's say 5, 4, 3, 1, 5, 3, 2, etc. Strictly decreasing, and you draw the graph of that and put it in a corner. So you get a base consisting of a partition and certain levels, which are also partitions. 
and so on. I'm sure you've all seen diagrams like this. You can think of these as cubes stacked upon each other. I'm sorry for the artwork. I'm a little bit short of time, so I can't do much better than that. So one thinks of these stacked pictures as forming a crystal. It's a three-dimensional partition, and we're looking at random processes of crystals. That form of the tau function, which you haven't, uh, I haven't explained, gives you essentially the generating function for this random process. I just have to explain to you what the notation is, and then I'll stop there. The point is, again, the example, the two-dimensional Grassmannian example, is typical in the sense that this determinant, W of t, projected orthogonally to h plus, can be represented, this determinant can be represented also using the exterior algebra, which is formed from our Hilbert space. This is what is called fermionic Fox space. So this exterior algebra, which, if you like, it's the span of all of the semi-infinite wedge products of the basis elements we had before, where this is now a strictly decreasing uh, sequence of integers, ending in zero. Well, ending eventually in all the negative numbers. So it, it saturates at some point with all the negative numbers. So this space plays the same role as in the finite Grassmannian was played by lambda 2 C4. C is now replaced by H, and lambda 2 is replaced by just any exterior product. These elements are basis elements for this, for the, for this uh, Hilbert space. These basis elements, labeled by a partition, are usually written lambda. That's what this means. <coughs> an alternative formula, an alternative way to represent this de determinant, is a scalar product on this exterior space. Every scalar product on an exterior space is a determinant, if you think about the definition of the scalar product. And so here's an alternative way to write it. One takes the vacuum state, which is the one consisting of the trivial partition, e minus 1, e minus 2, etc. One applies to the vacuum state a certain group element, which is exactly the group element that creates the element of our Grassmannian, w. Acting on the origin, g gives you w. So g applied to the vacuum, and we apply now the group element corresponding to the flow. Gamma plus t was multiplication by e to the ti, z to the i. All of that has a fermionic representation by lifting to the exterior space. And these two, just from the very definition, are the same thing. This scalar product on the exterior space and this determinant are the same thing. The Plicker image of H plus is the vacuum. And that's what connects the two. So that, now I'm trying to explain what this formula is. I haven't totally explained it because there is more here than meets the eye. Forget the integer n, just set that equal to zero. That's the trivial partition. This is the group element I was talking about, uh, but I'm afraid I didn't define this operator. This is a, also a, an operator which depends on the flow parameters in a certain way, involving a Q parameter, which is part of the model, such that instead of a flow, instead of a shift flow, this, remember, is represented by shift matrices, which are equal along the diagonal. Instead of that, just take diagonal matrices. Diagonal matrices in the Fourier representation, which is the Z to the I, the monomials, is just multiplication of Fourier coefficients, that's convolution product. So actually, this is 
we replace this by convolution actions, and that's what the middle element means. I don't have time to define it better, but basically it's convolution product with some fixed element of the Hilbert space, determined by these coefficients. And, okay, I can't uh, detail, everything goes into the parameters. This element is a certain uh, infinite series, which is actually in the gamma plus group. Depends on the parameters Q, I won't go into that. And this particular form, I have to just refer you to the literature, is also a tau function. It's a slightly more complicated one. And it acts as a generating function for this family of random processes, which involves, is involved in the crystal melting or crystal growth. I think I'll stop there.